started. Uh, welcome everybody to the Northampton Prevention Coalition meeting. We're really glad to see you all and thank you for uh, taking the time to join us today. Uh, some of you may know me, uh, some of you may not. I'm Gail Granrosa and I'm actually here working very closely with Marisa and with Karen and with other folks here. I work for a group called the Collaborative for Educational Services. We have a number of programs including the SPISI Coalition that you might have heard of. It's a countywide coalition and we also have a new branch of our services um, that is involved with doing some consulting, community health solutions. We are, a, I would say, we're a pretty integrated partner with the Northampton Prevention Coalition in a lot of different ways, so we like to work very closely together. We're going to do introductions in just a few moments, uh, but I just want to do a few housekeeping things. Um, hopefully everybody can see where you're sitting. We were trying to figure out how to, how to set up the chairs, and there's some chairs there. There is a camera there, so everybody make sure you look good because we're being videotaped. Oh. Uh, and we're going to have some time where you just need to direct your attention to the screen, and then we're going to break up uh, into two groups. So we'll be a little bit mobile and move around. Hopefully everybody got an agenda as they came in. If not, we'll have those around. Looks like many of you have main tags on, which we really appreciate. Thank you for doing that. Um, just to point out, sort of behind you are some snacks in what, at least when I was younger, we used to call them library carols. I don't know if they still call them that, but there's some snacks back there. So please help yourself to that. There are also uh, lots of uh, brochures and information, uh, background information, and some samples of the work done by the Prevention Coalition that you can avail yourselves of. Um, and as I said, we're going to look at some data and then we're going to have some conversation. But we'd also like to know a little bit more about, oh, I forgot. Don't forget the free blue stress ball if you've had a really hard day. Oh, I see somebody who's got it in front of them. <laughs> Squeeze the stress ball. There's some pencils over there. Help yourself to that as well. What we'd like to do just as an introduction is to have folks tell us who they are. If you are affiliated with an organization that you want to share, let us know about that. And then as just a little bit of a brain warm-up exercise, tell us one thing that you really like about Northampton. So your name, whatever organization you're affiliated with, you want to share that, and one thing that you really like about Northampton. And I guess I'm going to turn to my left and we'll kind of maybe go around that way. All right. So, so I'm Marisa Hebel from the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Um, one thing I really like from I love that people are so invested. Active and invested. Mm -hmm. I'm Trisha DeAndre from Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. And I love that it feels like a community. And I'm Heather Warner. I work with Gail at Spiffy and the Collaborative and Community Health Solutions. And um, oh gosh, I I just I like the downtown. Oh, I'm Ruth McGrath. Um, I work with the North Street Association. I'm recording this for them. It'll be up on YouTube tonight. And I like everything about Northampton. I came from Washington, where there's always something to do, and it's the same way in Northampton. David Narkowitz. I'm the mayor of Northampton. Um, uh, I love that we have organizations like the Prevention Coalition that takes a real proactive, collaborative approach to community issues and it tackles them head on. Uh, I'm Dave Sullivan, Northwestern District Attorney. Uh, I have three daughters, 15, 21, and 23, so I'm always very interested in the positive work that uh, Northampton Prevention coalition does and what I like about Northampton is I love the neighborhoods. I love Florence and Bay State and Ward 3 and I really always get a sense of community when I'm you know in those distinct neighborhoods so it's really the neighborhoods that really make a difference for me. Um, I'm Renee Westine. I'm a parent and also the advisor for the Northampton High School Key Club which is a student-led um, um, organization and this year we have 70 kids that voluntarily show up, pay $10, and um, energetic. And last night I was so tired I didn't want to go, and they just charged me up. So if any, anyone has time to volunteer with teenagers rather than adult police committees, it's so energizing. Because they, they just believe, and they just 
It's incredible. So they just really renew you. So and Renee, you're, you're known for your low energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even give it to me back. <laughs> Uh, Michael Bradsley, I'm on the board of the Prevention Coalition, and at least during this weather we've been having, uh, I like the fact that Northampton is so walkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Meredith O'Leary, I'm the Public Health Director for the City of Northampton. Um, I like the diverse population that we have here in Northampton, along with the great food. <laughs> oh, I'm Brian Lombardi, the principal. Um, to Something you like about Northampton. Something you like about Northampton. Well. Oh, okay, that's the question. Um, <laughs> um, the, the sense of community. I'm Karen Jarvis-Vance. I'm the program director for the coalition, and I'm the director of health and safety for the district. And uh, I've worked here for a long time, and I think the thing I like most about Northampton is how much uh, the community cares about I'm Ben Tagliari, I'm a social studies teacher here at the high school, um, and I love this place, so <laughs> I, I really love the high school. It's my connection to the community, and I don't want to work anywhere else. I'm Ryan O'Donnell, I'm a candidate for city council in Ward 3, and, uh, you know, I like that North Anthony, you don't always have to wear a tie, but I generally do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We're all about choices, we like <laughs> I'm Barbara Black, I'm the early childhood coordinator uh, for Northampton. And um, a lot of things. Um, well, my most current like is the new sidewalks in my neighborhood. <laughs> but in general, I actually mostly like it. Having lived here a long time, worked with lots of families, and now, and sort of getting the full circle of knowing parents and kids. I'm Lori John Lyon from New Hampshire Health and Nonprofit. Um, and I love that it's family friendly and I love that I could take, really love that I could take my two girls to the farmer's market, the Tuesday market, um, after school. Uh, my name is Jared. Uh, I'm here with these two as well and also representing uh, Protect Young Service, a nonprofit uh, based in Providence. It's my first time here. Uh, but I really like uh, Main Street. It's a uh, very walkable and I'm Chris Brennan. I'm one of the associate principals here. I love the students at North Hampton High School. I'm Celeste Melvezzi. I'm the other associate principal in the high school. Um, and I really like the diversity of the community. I'm Barbara Dillinger. I'm a parent of a new student here. And um, I like the dog park. <laughs> uh, I'm Ananda Lennox. I'm with the North Hampton Prevention Coalition as their youth engagement coordinator. And right now, my favorite thing about North Hampton is the fact that the youth elementary now offers a bird on half day uh, teacher conference week. So And Miles is here, and he's a Red Sox fan, so. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Diane Pruchak from UMass Amherst, the student <coughs> health motion, and I'm on the Spiffy Steering Committee. Um, one of my favorite things about Northampton is the summer night where I can play softball, <coughs> at local burger, and follow up with Harold. So I can decide. <laughs> Jim Ayers, I'm the executive director of the United Way for Hampshire County, and um, our work is about working together to create positive change, and in Northampton, people get the value of working together to create positive change, so it's a, a great community for us to do work in. I'm Trish Armstrong, I'm a wellness teacher here at the high school, and like Ben, I love this high school. I love my principal, I hope it's okay to say that. Um, love the Northampton <laughs> Prevention Coalition, but what I really love about this community is it's a great place to raise a family. Hi, my name is Renee. I'm a substitute school nurse from Northampton, and also I have a son that's a sophomore here. And I'm um, here to learn, uh, to actually know what's going on in the school system, and, and ditto to what a lot what Trish said. <laughs> and I'm Ellen Hirschberg, I'm a school nurse here at Bell High School, and I'm sorry I missed everybody's introduction, so hope I get to meet you all. A lot of you, I know. Anything you want to add about something you like about Northampton that hasn't been said yet? Anything? Well, since I missed a lot of what you said, but it's just a really beautiful place. I do, I went to college here, so I came up here from Long Island when I was 19, and I still kind of look around and go, wow, oh, it's really nice here. I can walk around here and see the beautiful place. And you know, it's not that kind of long. It's pretty gorgeous. <laughs> Everybody. I'm struck by the various organizations represented. That's exactly what this coalition model is all about. And I'm really struck by your deep investment in the health and well-being of not only kids, but the whole community. So that's kind of a nice segue to the next part of our agenda, that we're going to learn more about uh, what students told us in a survey that was done quite recently. So I'm going to turn things over to okay, you. Yeah, I think a few people here have probably seen this once or yeah. twice, but I think for the most part, um, I don't think any everybody has seen um, our new data. Um, so that's we're going to just um, skim through some highlights of our data. Please ask questions if you have, if you have them. I know people like to leave a little early. Um, we just decided actually we're going to start talking about our data in a little bit of a different way. We usually, and this is us in the public health field, talk about what's going wrong and what we need to be very worried about and what's bad and um, try to motivate everybody out of fear. Um, and that's really not the approach that we want to take because what's true is that Northampton students are doing a lot really well. And we really want to balance um, the hope of what's going really well with Northampton students with the concern about things we still need to work on. And there are things we still need to work on, but there's a lot going really well. And we don't want to be carriers of that misperception that our teens are one step away from destruction because they're not. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we care about youth substance use. Um, the teen brain not finished developing until around the age of 25. Um, and students who are regular drug and alcohol users tend to not do as well in school and have higher rates of delinquency and those kinds of things. And the truth is we really want Northampton youth to have the best start that they can and for a long and healthy life. So really that's what all of this boils down to. I'm going to move kind of fast because we took a while with the introductions, just let everyone know. So I'm going to show you Northampton student data. Um, we survey students in Northampton every two years. All students in Hampshire County are surveyed every two years. We survey students in 8th, 10th, and 12th. I'm going to move, but I want to hear your questions if you have any, so I don't think that I'm talking fast today. But I can answer your question. Um, so these are all the substances that we ask students about. This is 30-day use. 30-day use is an indicator of, this tells us what students are using regularly. So we use 30 days as an indicator of regular use. How do you know that the students are honest when they have to be certain? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there's a bunch of ways that we know. There's a bunch of catches in the survey. Um, first of all, the way that we administer the survey is really the most important part. So the surveys are administered anonymously, confidentially, and voluntarily, and those are the characteristics that we know people feel the most comfortable being honest on surveys. Um, we talk a lot with the teachers that are administering the surveys about how to administer them. And then there's a bunch of different catches in the survey. So the last question the survey asks, how honest were you on this survey? And apparently the way people answer that question <laughs> is the way they actually were on the survey. So if they said they weren't honest, their survey is not counted. 
Um, the survey catches for inconsistencies, so if you said you drank every day, but another question you say you never drank in your life, um, that survey is not counted. There's a false drug on the survey, so if a student is just clearly checking off, yes, 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 that survey is not counted. Did I forget anything? I think um, I those, those, those are sort of the, mm -hmm. the ways that we know we're most confident. It doesn't account for the super duper outliers, like the student who is really overestimating their use for some reason, or the student who really is underestimating their use in a big way. But those are outliers, and outliers don't tend to skew um, the averages. Are you, are you not touching this? Uh, I'm thinking the seniors that aren't here because they're not. Yeah, they're still doing drugs. I mean, yeah. when they're doing these surveys. In a I mean, school, in a, a like in a school-wide um, setting, like um, you know, you may have um, a, a large number of students, like say in, in Springfield or Holyoke, that have dropped out and just aren't catching them. So I, I think like it here, you you may be missing some of those students, but. Um, on any given 30 day, you know, or any given, you know, day, you're going to catch some kids, you know, but, but you do. It's necessary we get enough. Most of our students, most of our young people in Northampton are in school, and it's, you can't have right, we're not catching the students that aren't in school, but most are in school, and most take the survey, so. Okay. So just a quick aside about perception. Um, so, and some of you have heard this a number of times, but for anyone who has not. So our perceptions about what other people are doing really influences our behavior. Um, what we think most people are doing, we often misperceive what other people, what most people are doing. And this is really true when it comes to teenagers. So we tend to overestimate the unhealthy behaviors amongst our peers and underestimate the healthy behaviors amongst our peers. Um, and that, so our perception influences our behavior, but our misperception influences our behaviors too. And we're all carriers of misperception. The brain tends to hang on to the things that are outside of the norm. And then we talk about them and we reinforce them as the norm. So I'm gonna show you the students that are drinking or using marijuana, but I'm also gonna show you how many students are not, because that's actually the norm in this community. So we're looking at eight, 10th, and 12th grade use, and the purple on the bottom is students who are drinking, and the green on the top is students who are not drinking. And when we look at our total Marquette team, it's the norm in this community if you're a teenager to not drink. One thing, one first thing we can all do is correct misperceptions amongst ourselves, because um, we all may have perceptions about what teens are doing, and then help uh, teens correct their own misperceptions, because we know it's influential in their behavior. So we also know that most teens in Northampton are not binge drinking. So binge drinking for a woman having four or more drinks at one time, a man having five or more, because that's where we start to see negative consequences related to drinking. Um, most Northampton teens are not. So we ask students where they're getting alcohol from, and this is pretty common amongst all um, teens in Hampshire County and nationwide. I would imagine that social sources tend to be the top sources about alcohol. Um, one thing I'd just like to point out is that young people are not getting alcohol from our retailers. <laughs> our retailers are doing a really good job of checking fake IDs or not serving to teens. I'm just going to break this out a little bit. Most Northampton parents are not providing alcohol to teens. So one of the, um, here, um, getting alcohol at home with parents' permission. Um, do we have some concerns about the parents that are in the 30 to something percent of the month our seniors? Perhaps they don't know about the social host liability laws or many other reasons we're working on that. But by and large, by far, most parents are not allowing teens to drink at home. That's why teens by far are not drinking and driving. This is another place where a concern can be, I mean, it can be only up 12 students. We're still, a 12% of students, we're still concerned about that. There's still work to be done about that, but um, we don't want to reinforce that students here are drinking and driving because they're absolutely not. This is a new question this year. We ask students what negative consequences they were experiencing related to their drinking. We hear a lot like, we did it, we turned out fine, what's the big deal? We know that when we know the, the, the research around the brain, we want to know in here and now what negative students are experiencing. So, so this is interesting to find out. I kind of think that problems at school are a little underreported. I usually mention that on this slide. Because um, I don't know if all students are connecting, getting sick on a weekend, maybe being hungover on Sunday, and not being able to do school work. It's opinion, but I think that tends to be a little underreported. Um, same with marijuana use. So 8 out of 10 Northampton teens are not using marijuana. We're talking a lot about <coughs> marijuana and alcohol use when it comes to young people. Um, and we do not want to reinforce the perception that most teens are using marijuana. So they're not. 
<coughs> we have students where they're getting marijuana. Also, social sources are the <coughs> source. This is also a new question. Um, what negative consequences students are experiencing related to their marijuana use? This one, for sure, I would say doing poorly on a test or schoolwork is underreported. Only because the top four users here, amongst the top four, I'd say three of them feeling motivated, remembering things, and procrastinating to impact schoolwork. So there, I'd say, um, I think I'll also doing poorly. Oh yeah, please just jump in. Telling us that we need to perhaps be doing more, okay, sorry, more um, uh, age specific prevention with parents, particularly. Prevention looks different when your child is 12 than when your child is 18. Now, we've actually expected to be a little bit all over the map um, given just the changes that are taking place in, um, in Massachusetts. So in fall of 2008, we criminalization passed, and we expected to see a little bit of uptick. We surveyed in the spring of 2009. We didn't see that same uptick with marijuana and medicine. So we did with our sophomores, but not our seniors or our eighth grade, um, which is great. looked a little bit deeper into the data to see if there was any kind of relationship between our students who were drinking and using marijuana. So we're looking at students who did or did not drink in the past month and whether or not they also used marijuana. So the purple bar on the left shows us that among students who did not drink in the last month, about 5% also used, about 5% used marijuana. And then among students who did drink in the past month, about 52% also used marijuana. Didn't. We looked at the other way too, so among students who used marijuana, whether or not they drank in the last month. So amongst our students who did not use marijuana, about 18% had drank, were also drinking regularly, um, as opposed to amongst our students who did use marijuana, about 82% had also drank in the last month. Okay. Um, we're also looking at cigarette use and alcohol use. And alcohol use. So what, is that, what this is saying is that our students who have smoked cigarettes were much more likely to be also drinking. Um, the same thing was true with marijuana use. So our students who are not smoking are much less likely, smoking cigarettes are much less likely to be also using marijuana. Uh, another way that we de 
dig into our data a little bit is seeing if students said that their parents think it's wrong for them to drink, were they more or less likely to drink? Um, this is one of the things, one of our um, approaches is really directing our, helping parents, supporting parents in using all those behaviors that we know are protective for kids. So um, amongst our parents who, amongst our kids who said their parents think it's wrong for them to drink, um, they are much less likely to drink than if they said their parents don't think it's wrong. Same thing with marijuana. Students who said their parents think it's wrong, much less likely to. Um, so they're actually listening to us. They're actually listening to their parents. They hear you. And this helps us remind parents that we know that you, right here, right in this town. We know the research says it, but right here it helps let us know that um, it's working. They hear you. Knowing where your teen is also when they're not at home seems to be related to um, an increased risk of um, drinking, as well as. Um, Marijuana. So students who said that when I'm not at home, my parents know where I am and who I am with. This is the last data slide I'm going to show you, I promise. The last data slide, too. Um, this is just, we, we measured who, how many teens are accurately perceiving how many of their peers are drinking. So the green, this is a little bit different than the other slide. So the green on the top is those are the students of Horsch in each grade and total who are accurately estimating how many of their peers are drinking or underestimating. So these students have it right, or they think less students are drinking than actually are. But these students are overestimating. So these students think that more of their peers are drinking than actually are. These students think it's more the norm in this, in this community to drink. And most North Dakota teens are overestimating. This is really common. This is why past social norms campaign. Um, this is really common um, that, that students overestimate. But this is influential on behavior, and it's good for us to know. Particularly with our sophomores. Most of our sophomores think it's the norm if you're a teenager to be drinking when we know it's actually not the norm. The same is true with marijuana use, and actually even more so with marijuana use. And this is one of those reasons why it's really important for us to be correcting those misperceptions. And particularly, so 80% of our sophomores think that it's more the norm in this community to be a smoker, if you're a, a, to use marijuana if you're a teenager than actually are using. Is that, is that competing with everyone? Um, so this is just the thing, some of the things that we're doing, some of the things we're going to work on today for everybody who anybody can stay. We're going to break out into two groups and look at our coalition priorities and what we're working on. These are the priorities. These are the um, sort of root causes, availability, parent attitudes favorable to use, youth attitudes favorable to use, and community laws and norms favorable to use. Um, so these are our priorities and things that we're going to be talking about today with how we're going to be addressing these things over the next year. Coalition priorities when it comes to marijuana. This summer, um, and many of you attended actually, we had a retreat with about 30 community members um, where we looked at all of our data and um, created logic models, which are like the public health roadmap to what we're, do what we're doing and why. Um, and a lot of people here were, were involved in that, which is great. Um, and we, we broke, this is sort of like the part two of um, putting it into action now. Today, we have so, our prescription drug numbers, even though we're really paying attention to them, our prescription drug numbers tend to be very low, so we're actually going to break out into talking about alcohol and marijuana and what our priorities are with those two substances. There was a lot of work done um, with prescription drugs in that group this summer at the retreat, so I just want to acknowledge that work that was done, but um, we have a lot more work to do when it comes to alcohol and marijuana. I'm not going to go through all this. This is just what a logic model looks like, just to show you. Um, we break down um, around alcohol use. This is how we sort of know what we're doing and why. And it's all data-based and data-driven. Same with marijuana and prescription drugs. Just a really quick, um, I'm going to have a, a little guide at, at all the tables about this, but these are sort of the ways that we approach affecting community change. Um, and there'll be sort of a, a detailed there uh, thing uh, on everybody's table. But the bottom four are the ones that we know are the tend to be the, they're all important and we need to have things going on in each area, but the bottom four tend to um, produce the most lasting change. So I would just um, ask you to think about that too, where we have, where we have gaps, where we need to be working more. And um, you'll all hand out that your table. All right, that's it. Does anyone have questions about the data or want to talk about that before I kind of zip through it? Oh. Yeah. Compared to like state and national averages, how are our, our local uses numbers? 
Um, so you, we tend to, Massachusetts tends to be higher as a state, and Hampshire County tends to be higher as, um, <coughs> as a county across the state, and then Northampton tends to be slightly higher than that. Right, Karen? I have the actual. So, a little bit. We tend to be a little bit higher than the county um, on, on some things, not everything. Um, a little bit. And when I say a little bit, I, I can get you. I have a, a district profile that can show you all of the uh, county averages. Oh, Marisa, I just wanted to point out, though, that also in Northampton, <coughs> um, like some of the protective factors are also higher. Yeah. Right. So you, yeah. there's, some, there's some good positive influences happening as well. Right. But it's straight up in terms of use, we tend to be a little bit higher than the county average, but um, there's a lot that we're also like better than the county average on positive things that are going on here too. Is that, so is the trajectory of these numbers been downward since they say the late 90s? Or it seems like they're developing low ones I remember seeing. Years yeah, well in this community they've been on a downward trend. Karen can see more of the trends from since you started. They've been, um, they were pretty stable for the late 90s and the early, 2000. Um, since we got the Drug Free Communities Grant, they've started to definitely decrease. Since we've been really targeting interventions at, at these issues, they've been starting to go down. But over a long, long period of time, we really haven't changed the whole But I think also there's communities where, where staying flat or going down a little is better than some communities yeah. which are heading up. Yeah. So just to acknowledge that flat can sometimes <laughs> indicate the success. Good word. Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, I guess my question is, I don't know if it can really be answered. I, just, I didn't see any data around um, um, use being influenced by peer group or use um, occasional. Have so much more data than I told okay. you. Occasional okay. versus um, habitual, like occasional use versus regular use. and. No. So we use 30 days as the indicator of regular use. So, so anything I was showing you for the most part was 30 days. So Can that was right regular use. So at least once in the previous 30 days. That's sort of the well, public health okay. standard. Once or more. Once That's sort of the public health standard of our regular Once or more a month. Once or more. The previous 30 days is considered regular use. That's the standard of regular use. But there also are questions about how um, heavily, how many, how many times have you done that behavior within the last 30 days as well. Yeah. So you can break it down more. We have lots more data than this is like the typical stuff. I want to just ask a different question. I know you're mostly talking about drugs here. Mm -hmm. But is it under your purview? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, our, so we're funded to look at substance use, but we also know that substance use does not happen in a vacuum. So positive and risky things that are going on amongst prevention use, we're interested in all of them. Um, how much resources we can devote to testing and driving. We actually do have a team group that's starting um, here, and I know that teams are really interested in testing and driving, so um, I can certainly see it becoming a project of the Northampton yeah. Coalition Youth Group. Yeah. Adults or you know, exactly. yeah, I think so we, we model stuff. Alcohol, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, do we have more questions? What we're thinking we'll do is um, break into two groups. Hopefully, not everyone's going to the marijuana group. Hopefully, there'll be some alcohol people, the people in the alcohol group. Um, and we're gonna just look at. Um, <laughs> I know there's probably a lot of people here to talk about marijuana, but um, yeah, I don't know what you think about location. Um, Maybe the alcohol group can meet over there, um, and uh, people are interested in talking about marijuana and um, things around that, and stay in this area. Um, 
Yeah, if you were just here for the data portion, this would be sure you have to go. Thank you very much for being here. So the printout, do you have one? Do we have one of these? Do I have enough for everyone? The printout, we're, so we're looking at like what we um, broke down based on our data this summer at our retreat. Um, and what the purpose of today really is to look at sort of our priority local conditions and talk about um, what we're doing, what we want to do with each one. So, um, so we're looking at sort of our, what the problem is, what the root causes are, and then what the local conditions are. This is really how we help students for them. <laughs> yes, it may have been a hazardous promotional there. Um, so each page on this little handout that you have is related to one of our local conditions, one of our priority local conditions. Um, so may I just give people a few minutes to sort of go over this document? I know a couple of people have seen it before, but a couple of people have not. Um, so we're just looking, maybe just to take a quick review, and hopefully we can just have a conversation about what strategies we think the coalition should take on in this coming year. So in bold. Oh, yes, I'm pretty excited. Actually, it wasn't me. I flew the ball with Karen. She couldn't handle it. Actually, I couldn't catch the ball. Right. You did a nice job at the front of So while you're looking, we've already had a solid conversation about um, things that are things that are already happening. If you look at that first page, you see strategies and interventions are over on the right, and um, the things that are not in italics are things that we're either already doing or that we already know we'll plan to be doing in this coming year. Um, so like if you look at one of these sort of breakdowns, we've got like what we're actually doing. This is like what the problem is, why is it a problem, and then the local condition is why is it a problem here. And then all the way on the right is are the strategies and interventions that we plan to use or that have been proposed. Uh, and sort of what we want to get down to is just look at everything and then um, um, have a discussion about what people think the coalition's priorities should be in terms of what we should do in the coming year. So. And a lot of things have been proposed doesn't mean we're actually taking on every single one. that the word you believe not believing marijuana is harmful. Yeah. So, um, Which is what they're learning. Karen can tell us about what the Northampton students are learning. Well, they get help in seventh grade and eighth grade, and then again a wellness course, two semesters of wellness in high school. Do we have limited no. Well my daughter went to Hopkins and she had help um, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, all the way up and all the way through. And I was just wondering it would be interesting to see if there's some, you know, the schools that do have that kind of program or those, you know, has that just to see if there's what the community what the effects are in the community. You know, that's interesting. Why don't we actually turn to the the third page? I'm sorry, the fourth page, which that actually kicks us off to youth not believing that marijuana is harmful for young people. Um, the, some of the things that we're already doing are, um, so all of our ninth grade students are getting a brief intervention by our nurse who happens to be here, <laughs> by one of our nurses who happens to be here. Um, uh, so those students are having a conversation about um, marijuana use. And then we have this one thing, I'm sorry, substance use in general. Um, and then we have the health classes in seventh and eighth grade. 
um, still are we're seeing our rates of perception of harm related to marijuana use is going down. So that might be somewhere we can start talking about how we want to um, help students know that mar youth marijuana use is not um, positive or beneficial. Well, I would think that is different if, if an adult can do it and it's fine for an adult not even getting into the medical marijuana but just the whole perception then why can't a kid do it and the fact that they have different medications. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting point because um, when we did the screening which I'll explain real quickly for those that may not be aware um, this year we implemented a new program which is really the first probably the first of its kind in high school in the country mm -hmm. where Seriously, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. so, it's pretty cool. So what we do is when we typically screen kids for vision and hearing and scoliosis and all that other stuff, um, we're, at, we're administering a screen about their substance use. Um, and it's just a very brief, brief questionnaire that asks them a few questions about their use. And then depending on what their score is, what their answers are in the screen, the school nurses have been trained to do a technique called motivational interviewing which is a way of having a conversation with someone that's not at all judgmental and feel free to jump in since mm -hmm. you're like the queen of this. Um, <laughs> feel free, <laughs> it's not at all judgmental or it's really just very educational and very exploring each individual's own reasons for use and their motivation to maybe cut back or change that and then helping mm -hmm. them to think about ways that they can do that. It's a really different way of talking, especially to kids and it's pretty awesome. Um, so every kid in the ninth grade uh, receives this screen and, and receives that kind of motivational interview. And what was really interesting is we did the screen on a piece of paper. They did it on a paper. It was a paper screen. And then we handed them their screen back when they left. And on the back of it, there was some just some information. One of the pieces of information was about the brain and the effect of substance use in general on the brain. I actually had a graphic, like a PET scan of the brain of a user and a non-user. We, uh, we got feedback from the students after the screening was over. We surveyed all the students in the ninth grade to ask them about their perceptions of the screening itself. And one of the questions we asked, which was an open response one, did you learn anything new? And by and large, the answer that I got back the most was, I learned about the brain or something about the brain. Mm -hmm. The effect, I didn't know about the effect it had on the brain. And at the DA's conference, we were just out last week too, by and large, that was the feedback that they got from the kids too. The, the opening speaker was all about, she was a researcher from Harvard, um, a neurologist, a neurobiologist or some neuro block. And but her thing is she studies the, the adolescent brain and substance use. And by and large, she feedback from that from the kids that they were, they're fascinated with their, with their brain mm. and what goes on in there and how this can affect it. Mm. So I think that's a really good way to, to so talk to Focusing on the brain. Mm. Yep. I think when we focus group students last spring and one thing we heard a lot of was that right now when it comes to marijuana, all they're hearing is that it's medicine. And they're hearing that, um, especially in light of the dispensary opening downtown and reinforcing that it's medicine, they're not getting the same balance that we don't want young people to use. They're not hearing anything about the brain. I'm just curious what people think about that. Yeah, I think there's a balance because something that I work on um, is also overdose prevention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, this is, you know, an epidemic in the Northeast right now, killing a lot of young people. But we have to strike a balance between saying it's highly abusive, it's highly addictive, and fatal. Um, it meaning? It meaning opiates. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm using opiates as an analogy because we, we this is a standard medicine that we use, um, and yet we don't want to make it to the point where someone who does really need opiates can't have opiates, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the same thing we're dealing with education about, uh, you know, how to handle you know, prescription drugs, how to store your prescription medications, how you dispose of them, all that. Um, so I, I think we kind of need to revitalize how we think of this education because there are people who really need it for medicine, but how do we convey the that, that idea that you can't just self-medicate without you know, talking to a physician? Because um, that's something that I work on with, uh, with prescription detailers mm -hmm. and see if maybe a model like that could be adopted for marijuana, for medical marijuana, to 
draw a clear line that says, you know, we're a community that cares about the people. Yeah. People who are going through, you know, palliative care, end of life care, but that doesn't mean that anyone who hasn't consulted their physician can just use medicine. Yeah, absolutely. I think right now that the loud voice, we haven't, you have to be telling us they're not hearing about the harms yeah. related to these views. Also, thank you for the work that you do in that area. Um, <clears throat> one thing that uh, this gets me is also working with our doctors because it's really easy in this community to get yeah. opiates and yeah. narcotics. It's really easy. Um, too easy. Um, so I think we need to do some more work mm-hmm. there too around that around because it's just way too. Good. Mm-hmm. That's a good point that I haven't really thought about. Part of our prescription drug. Um, logic model and the interventions that we plan to do around that is hopefully some physician more education for parents about storage and monitoring of prescription medication which we've been doing but do better work with that but also we have talked about doing some physician education Mm -hmm. and I have thought about that that could also correlate with marijuana Mm -hmm. recommendations yep it's like any condition under the sun, you can qualify yeah. for a marijuana yeah. license, you know, and so, and the same thing, I mean, some providers are tired yeah. than others, but I would love to be part of it. We could pop in on some of the meetings they have throughout the year, just to give little... But seniors aren't even going. To I know, but parents are. So sometimes but, but some of that how do you engage the kids, kids, and how do you get kids to, once kids start drinking or get involved, it's fun. I mean, we were all young. I assume we all <laughs> had a drink or a smoke or did something. So it, so once they they cross over that, that's what I'm saying, like in eighth grade, you still you still got them. But in tenth or you know, when they get older and they do have a beer or they do, you know, smoke, it's it's fun. That's obviously that's mm-hmm. adults do it, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you engage where they can have fun without alcohol? And I would love to have a school dance. Like it seems like that's a culture not in this high school other than the prom. So and about supervisor and all that stuff. But that, the latest in health education, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, it's all about harm reduction. But it's what, what are we doing? harm reduction. You do that more when you're fresh out of college. You talk about dosing, appropriate dosing, how to drink water in between. But that would not be something I would be comfortable with. No, I say, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is, why can't we have a dance here where there's no alcohol? Like, where they can have fun without it. Like, right. I just feel like there's not a link anymore. Like, right. these kids go to parties, like, everyone's drinking, everyone has a beer, everyone, you know, or they're playing video games, you know, where they're not engaged. So, like, can there be a social event where it's dry and they have fun? Like, it seems like... To get reminded. To remind them, like, yeah, oh, it could be fun. You know, it just seems like we yeah. can still catch yeah, that, them, but, that, but we don't catch them. just came up the other day, how we, you know, people our age miss that culture for our kids in the high school. Like mm-hmm. They used to be once a month or mm-hmm. every other week. But yeah, we don't have that at all. No, you know, they look at that, no, one's going to go up, they can't drink. I'm like, really? Like, and I'm trying to get into maybe the key club, but sometimes, I don't know how much money they have, but kids love food. I mean, if it was like free pizza, like yeah. Yeah. Friday night so pizza, you know, and maybe it could be kind of yeah. slow, it's mm-hmm. just free pizza and a mm-hmm. DJ or something. And we enough parents are super well, well, we're saying we're, we're something on a regular basis. We sort of talked about, we talked about parents and kids, and okay. absolutely kids, and in fact, even, you know, just to think about one of the things we heard about in the focus groups that were done um, was some of what happens before particular events and during particular events mm-hmm. at particularly sporting mm-hmm. events mm-hmm. at the high school basketball. <laughs> the kids mm-hmm. told us, in, you know, before yeah. and at halftime basketball, whatever, it's kind of an, un, you know, culture for alcohol to mm-hmm. be involved. So one of the strategies to, for the coalition to be thinking about is looking at, you know, ways to curb that as well as, you know, ways to provide some kind of alternative. So there's something else going on at halftime and, and not, you know, attempted to do the alcohol and to maybe more address even that sort of pre-game kind of thing. Um, I just want to get back to the parents for, you know, maybe just a quick second and think about, again, from a community-wide perspective, in addition to the education, alternative activities, things to be thinking about that we've made note about. What about these policy, potential policy changes that might be in a more sort of law enforcement context? What What's your thought about things like teen party ordinances that some communities have. Um, There are places where the police and the schools communicate Monday morning about what happened over the weekend in terms of what the police
us would see in that kind of context, unsupervised parties, um, looking at you know whether or not the certain groups of students like you know involving the athletics department to be sure that all of those policies are being followed, where the kids mm-hmm. who are engaged in sports are not supposed to be a violation of the statewide. So I guess what's your take? Because that's a little bit different from the education and from. Well, I think that <laughs> last year, Heather, um, the meeting that you ran in East Hampton, the town hall meeting, and there was somebody there from the um, DA's office mm-hmm. talking about the social host laws. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was really brilliant because a lot of parents have heard about these laws. You know, they know they exist, but they actually had copies of the laws out for people to grab. And there were so many parents there. There were a lot of questions asked, and there was you know, education going on. Like it was, you know, seemed like a big aha moment for a lot of parents. Like, wow, you know, this could happen to me. Yeah. So I, I would love to see some sort of campaign like that in this community where we're hosting some sort of event where we're educating parents about what those laws are and what they mean and how it you know, includes some case studies. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, we had a neighbor who not too long ago went away and had a high school senior watch her house, you know, home sitting slash pet sitting for like, it's kind of like a long weekend, I think, wasn't it? She had some friends over. This is a good kid, high achiever, straight A's. Um, she had, you know, a couple of friends over, and before you know it, word got out, and there were, you know, 30, 30 or 40 people there, and she was finding, you know, alcohol bottles in the basement, you know, next couple of days, I mean, you know, so um, she was concerned about this, but how, if, if somebody had gotten hurt, you know, and left that house, would she be accountable? And the answer is yes, I believe she would be, um, because it's her house, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So maybe more information and education and, and ways to get that information out about what the current laws are, yeah. along with potentially looking at whether or not there might be some additional policies that the community might want to, to take a look at. Yeah. I think, and I always think, too, that sometimes as parents, not all parents come to events in schools, but like when you hear a school leader say, you know, you are still the most influential person in your child, it's a reminder, I think, to mm-hmm. people of how much actual influence they have. And I even think of it with pediatricians when I mean, your kid goes for the annual. And so, again, how do you remind healthcare providers, you know, this is an important message you know, to be giving, and again, by teenagers, many kids go by themselves at that point to go to physicians. Just to kick out of the room. Right, but <laughs> it's also to kind of keep it on people's radar that, you know, that this is, you still have a lot of influence. Because I do think people actually say, okay, I've taught my child good decision making, they know how to set goals and reach them. You know, so come 15, 16, 17, but to realize, particularly if you don't, haven't had a lot of children, you haven't had those years of having the older siblings and let many bigger families mm-hmm. had historically. I just don't think parents actually always see such a part of the, the active work throughout their child's life. Mm-hmm. I think that's so, so important right now because of the culture that's in society. It's like parents have become so many of those things. Feel that sort of towards that idea that you are influential mm-hmm. and that your limit setting and your clarity about what your expectations are really does mm-hmm. make a difference. Mm-hmm. And that you need to do that regularly. And you're saying, and maybe it changes a little bit as you know with age difference, but really not to let go of that even when they're seniors, mm-hmm. because we're seeing that the seniors are. I mean, I think the dance that parents, you know, have is how to stay connected with their kids by having, you know, those meaningful conversations and not getting shut out because they're being so strict, but yet the message you're sending has true value, even though you're not never going to be the house that the kids come to, you know, (laughs) you're doing something right too, and so it's that delicate balance of staying connected and being a resource to them, you know, and yet holding a line, and, you know, yeah. and then I think like what you were saying too, like, so then I think like the social norms and then the, you know, making changes throughout the community through, you know, getting the police on board with some sort of system of like, yeah, what is the consistent system here, how are we deal with 
what is the message pediatricians are getting? What is the message they get at the hospital? What is the message, you know? So I think like, you know, by, you could, the efforts here and this coalition can be exponentially growing if we bring in those other people. And I think the police should actually, I know so many And the police are kids, they're involved here. But I know so many, so many parties that are broken up and the police say, call your parents, like parents get there. I would love the police to put them in a holding cell. So, you know, like if, you, if you're held in a holding cell, it's a little reality. And I think that um, too many health providers, whether it's ambulance, police, police are like, They'll say like, oh yeah, this I I had the same issue, or I had the, you know, they kind of like, I think they kind of sweep it under the rug and think that's part of growing up. And I think that if they were scared a little more, I had this whole discussion um, with marijuana that people don't realize that if kids get um, found with marijuana, it goes on their record in terms of their their um, point system with driving. So, you know, these kids need to understand that's money. Like, kids are really into money. And so when they start driving to say, I know that. yes. There's an educational thing. Well, well, and I, and you know, you, you get a citation because it's, right. if, if it's under an ounce. It's, it's not it's legal, not but it goes to the, it's, it's, it's civil right. Civil so civil right. Civil so civil I told my kids. I know whatever I'm reading. Yes, yeah. So, so I told I tell all my his friends over mm-hmm. that come over. And they're like, really? So, um, yeah, so it's like, you know, it's fear, but it's reality. I just, I just think that it's, it's a wake-up call if they're actually held. <coughs> Maybe not overnight right. in the cell, but, but I well, think it's well, a lot we've heard from the police is that they're limited in their ability to intervene in certain parts, especially if they're big, as well as the fact that the majority of parents in the community don't feel that way. That they don't want, uh, they'd like to have a, a, a jarring experience for their kids, but then all of a sudden they get referred to the court system and they don't want their kids paying those kind of penalties up into college. Of course, but that's what they're like, protect, well, so like this is a rock and a hard place right, for the police. Right. Because they're they just getting, them. But, they, the but they, yeah, it's not that easy. You know, if they're in the cell, then they, they're 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 there's a paper trail. Yeah. Right. So yeah. at that point, they're in. And, right. and, and exactly. so as much as we want them to be jarred. But, you know, well, I, what um, I'm hearing is that maybe the coalition at least should, you know, have more of that kind of dialogue with right. the police. And like I said, they're involved with the coalition and to think about what are the consequences, you know, for the young people. You know, another strategy is, is what are the consequences for parents in terms of and the adult, in terms of any of these unsupervised parties that you were going to say? I'm a big fan of policy changes yeah. um, on a lot of levels because I think that it gives a message to the community. But it, what you want, don't want to do is ostracize yourself as well. Um, for instance, we're sort of swimming against the tide with what's going on with marijuana. But I also think that a lot of people from our generation who grew up drinking at 18 with a much different message haven't paid attention to the research that we now know about the brain development and the impact that it has and all the rest. And so I love the messaging that goes on with the banners in town and stuff because it, yeah. the, mm-hmm. the parents who are okay. giving a quiet nod to using in their households or, oh, it's the norm, aren't aware of the fact that there's a lot more knowledge now that actually it's not so good. Mm-hmm. And that just seeing that written in front of you is like, oh, like 80% of the parents are not thinking the way I am, you know, that yeah. it's sort of, those kind of things are helpful. Um, sort of quiet education about where, you know, what the researchers show us. So that it's kind of bring people up to speed. It's kind of the same message as, you know, that joke about the father on the porch with the shotgun when the daughter's um, boyfriend <laughs> is going to show up. Well, the message you're actually giving your daughter is, I don't trust your ability to make a good decision about your boyfriend. You know, and so th- that's not really the best approach to sort of how to sort of give your daughter a good education and how you go about choosing someone to date. Well, it's the same sort of thing. It's sort of like the way that we disseminate the information might sort of challenge people to step up to the, the realities that we have today, which are different from what we grew up with, you know? I mean, so I, I love the social norms campaign that we do and finding different ways. I like the idea of um, Mr. Lombardi standing up before school events where there's a lot of parents and just maybe giving a um, coalition a moment and having Marisa get up and just sort of say, here's what we're doing. You know, like as, as often as possible, sort of when you get a group of parents, when you have a group of parents around, to sort of just give out one little tidbit, you know, and then... Right. Because sometimes if you have these events, you're speaking to the... You're preaching to the choir. And so if it's a different situation and there's one little tidbit, it's going to jar And I guess one question I would have for all of you, as Marisa mentioned with the, with the data, you know, what's your response to the idea of looking at not only what some of the rates are, but also looking at that positive side, 
you know, does that feel like a good way to continue oh, for parents also to, to have their misperceptions maybe yeah, correctly and challenged? So. Go ahead. The part about clamping down and making new rules and laws shouldn't be just here because it should be, you know, a little bit around our community mm -hmm. because the kids are going to do it and find a place where they can go. So I think it was two falls ago there were four or five kids that were suspended from the soccer team for drinking in the East Town. But they were mm -hmm. not going to be found out or something. Mm -hmm. Somehow so they, they got found out. out. Mm -hmm. Well, one piece yeah. of good news is that East Hampton and South Hadley were just funded to have their own drug free communities. So they will have the same funding that this coalition mm -hmm. has, and they will be setting up strategic plans and starting this whole process there. Great, but I hear what you're saying to, to work, right, yeah. to work oh, collaboratively, oh, sure. have, especially if we're talking about kinds of policies or even local yeah, well, and especially social networking. Yeah. These yeah. kids right. are friends with all of these mm -hmm. people in these neighboring And they may be traveling so that if there's a consistent message or yeah. approach. Yeah, it's so important. I just remembered something. My two older kids were at a private school, but they had gone to elementary school here, so they were still connected. connected. So there was that kind of intermix going mm -hmm. so there. And someone mentioned, obviously, as the, as the older teens are driving, then they're more mobile. Mm -hmm. They're connecting with each other, and depending upon where they think it might be less likely to have a negative consequence, maybe that's where they're going right. mm -hmm. to sort of think. This is a question that I have, and I'm just kind of curious what people's thoughts are, because the culture around the alcohol right now isn't just having a beer, but rather the alcohol content that's in the Physicians who smoke cigarettes is just information doing the thing. But a lot of the information that's coming out is new, it does matter, because I know of people who um, thought, you know, if, if my kids are going to smoke or drink, let them smoke because the drinking makes them mean, makes them this, it's addictive, and mm -hmm. all of these different things, and they're addicted. As, and they're very surprised, there's um, a figure at some point, if you did drugs at a certain age, you become addicted to it, you're more likely to develop an addiction, and that's a physiological. That was um, a surprise mm -hmm. to some of the parents that I've talked to, and the fact that the teenage brain is affected by drugs. I don't know why logically it, it, they didn't seem to get it, but that was a surprise too. That it was that you know it's not the same adult brain getting high and kid brain getting high, but it's different. And I think that that knowledge really does matter because I have seen firsthand how it's mattered with um, people that I've known, you know, with kids. And you they, had, education they, they didn't care if the kids smoked pot. They didn't care. I mean, as long as you don't over this, it's not a gateway drug. Blah 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 blah. All yeah. these things, as opposed to the fact that. It does harm your brain, and, and you know, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know there was a difference between me and my kids' brain and yeah. that, you know, for the effects. Mm. Just talking about the community level. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> all of the stuff that we're doing with the uh, retailers and the bars and the restaurants and the Japanese seem to keep mm -hmm. happening, and that could work some of the availability on that end. Um, the work with the dispensaries is going to be really important to work mm -hmm. with the with providers and people who are writing scripts are going to be important on the community level. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like that, that work, the policy enforcement really needs to be looked at. Um, I mean, the law was just written so crappy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but the law wasn't written good, you know, and the law really was written to be so it's one step away from legalization. I don't, part of it's like, if you want to legalize, just write the law that way, you know, so it's it's coming in in this, in this just backwards way that I was messed up. So anyway, policy how do you do it in the school, um, <laughs> and then how do we do it in our communities? And then, what are the intervention steps that we're doing? Yeah. So yeah. Having yeah. escort in the school is, is really groundbreaking. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you have to acknowledge that students are actually using in order to have those conversations. So many schools have been afraid to do that on the secondary level. Some occasions. Mm. Mm. What would you like to see in the sensory in terms Because I was actually talking to people about doing to help. 
help educate our students, our, you know, the parents of the students, mm -hmm. community members as a whole. Or I'm so 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 yeah. yeah. so yeah. so 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 we need to talk. And yeah. that's exactly, I mean, my, my push would be we need uh, health education pre K through 12th grade. We absolutely need that. And, and there are curriculums, we use the All Stars curriculum in the middle school, which have a parent component. So there are things that parents need to have conversation with their children about as part of the curriculum. And I, I just, I feel like that is super important. And I'll go back to when my position was created in 1978, it was because of a huge uptick in teen pregnancy. And there was this big public outcry because there was no sex education in the school. And this position was created to bring that about. And part of this position being created, there was health education. And then in the uh, 90s, when HIV was really uh, coming out as a huge prevalent disease, we got condoms in our Kenton High School, which was one of the only high schools in the country to offer condoms. Um, that was another public health measure, though, that came out of the whole, we need to educate our kids, and we need to protect our kids. So I just want to put that out there to uh, <laughs> that pre-K through <laughs> health education mm -hmm. is absolutely crucial in this changing. Okay, just that I think the other piece, the thing that I do in, in my life and with lots of folks in the community is stuff around family engagement mm -hmm. with children, families with children under the age of eight mm -hmm. and starting at eight. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's all related and so it is something that Karen and I have talked about this we really need to, you know, have it be an integrated approach. And it's not, I mean, you know, I, the focus of this group is around health issues. The focus of the council that I have is around child development issues, but it's all related. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out how to make, you know, mm -hmm. without without only doing one or the other or the other or the other, yeah. we have to figure out ways to continue to work together and make it all Anyway, that's yeah. Um, just and also just thinking about um, you were talking about what maybe perhaps the dispensaries could be doing around this around this issue. And I, I'm shooting from the hip a little bit, but I'd love to see um, people getting um, information about the consequences for diverting their marijuana, particularly diverting mm -hmm. yeah. diverting marijuana to young people. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to enforce that consistently. What the penalties are going to be for diverting marijuana to young people. Um, I'd love to see people getting information with the marijuana around um, what the, uh, the, the science around the teen brain and marijuana use, only because I, I, I mean, we have some parents who are allowing their kids to drink. I don't know if that means we have some parents who are gonna also going to allow their young people to use their marijuana as medicine. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it's all going to play out, but, um, but I'd love some kind of policy around what education to the, 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 the patients uh, that come in. Something else, because we were talking about it too, and you know, because I feel strongly about drug feedback programs, yeah. but also, you know, making sure that to reduce diversion, you know, educate everybody about drug feedback of medical marijuana so that it's disposed of properly. You know, we have such an issue. Well, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Yeah. 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 I just thought it was burning and then it's like, everyone's ever going to have it. I've incinerated everyone's ever going to have it. No, in other states, they don't want to take that. Yeah, I'm in New Jersey. Um, oh, uh, they do. They do. They do take that. Um, so do they get a lot back? I'm, I'm not sure. It's a really small program in New Jersey. Um, it's like really, really tiny. Uh, oh, it's so expensive. And so uh, they, do, they do require that if you have funding, We're just thinking too of how to be mindful of, of, yeah. thing, of yeah. issues. Yeah. And, you know, this is the big issue for me. Yeah, to the opiates. You know, it's so easy to have something in my friend who has high school, now college, each son. She said that she got, got medication. She had dental surgery and then left over yeah. and got a hold of it. You know, these are things to be mindful of. And treating again, you know, treating medical marijuana like. Yeah, even extending the same conversation, we do, um, we, we teach parents about, like, lock boxes, like, how to safely store your medication. I'm sorry, Hampshire Health does opiate? 
no, 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 no. I, um, I'm, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Protect Family First. And so one of our things is over those prevention. I'm, I'm here because Lori invited me to work on it. So, great. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, you know, we do education about how to store your medication away from your children, um, how to do that beyond your house, like if you have older parents, you know, so grandparents. To think beyond, you know, I'm sending kids to grandpa, grandma's house. No, grandma also has medication that you as a parent want to make sure it's stored properly. Um, and so extending that same analogy beyond prescription into medical marijuana to make sure that, you know, any material is also kept the same way that we would do with any other medication, which we aren't doing a great job, but people need to be educated about how to handle it. I just don't even realize it. Yes, you can buy one of the ones that you have to You can buy a lot of boxes. Mm -hmm. You can well do it too. Yeah. Um, so. I have a time question. Yeah, we're actually supposed to wrap up. I actually need to be back at the Bridge School. And I'm looking for a ride from someone who's going downtown. Who will, will be I'll just give you a ride, by the Okay, I need to be there by two minutes before.